Hi, I'm Jeff Bailey from s and Cycle. I'm Dan Kinsey, and today we're going to talk about what it really takes to go fast. We're here at the s and Cycle Museum in Viola, Wisconsin, surrounded by some of the fastest V-twin motorcycles in racing history. s and Cycle has always been about making power and going fast. Even before s and Cycle existed back in the 1940s and early 50s, George J. Smith, the future co-founder of s and Cycle, was experimenting with ways of making more power to make his own motorcycle go faster. In the process, he set a number of records at the drag strip and at Bonneville, but sometimes, and especially at Bonneville, there's more to going fast than just a lot of horsepower. We both work here at s and Cycle, and we're both Bonneville record holders, and we've both been clocked at over 200 miles an hour. You may have noticed that Dan has a red 200 mile per hour club hat on, and I don't. You may be wondering what's up with that. Jeff's mom told him never to wear his hat in the house. <laughs> Actually, there's more to getting in the 200 mile an hour club than just achieving 200 miles per hour. Not only do you have to go over 200, but depending on the class you're running in, you have to achieve a certain minimum speed set by the club. The reasoning behind those minimums isn't very clear, but those are the rules of the game we're playing. Back in the 1980s, when I was racing at Bonneville, you just had to go over 200 mile an hour. For the class I'm racing in, I not only intend to break the current record of 201 miles per hour, currently held by Chris Rivas, but for the 200 mile an hour club, I'll have to go over 215 miles an hour. So that's my goal, 215 miles per hour in a red hat. Intuitively, you'd think that the way to go faster was to make more horsepower, but in this case, you need to race smarter, not harder. That's absolutely right. You certainly need power to go fast, but traction and aerodynamics play a major role in Bonneville racing. Unlike asphalt, the salt surface is kind of slippery, and at the speeds we're going, you get some really extreme aerodynamic drag on the bike. You'll actually reach a point where the wind resistance gets so strong, it equals the amount of force the tires can exert to push the bike forward. So no matter how much power you have, you're limited by traction. To make matters worse, vehicles that go really fast have an added disadvantage because we have to shave the tread off the tires to make them lighter. As fast as these wheels spin, a heavy tire will be torn apart by centrifugal force. Just look at the tires on Nitro Express or Tramp 3. Those tires are smooth as a school arm's leg way up. In 1991, I set a record of over 226 miles an hour. But according to the tachometer, I should have been going about 270. The rear tire was slipping that much, even though we had added over 80 pounds of lead to the bike. Actually, there's not really much we can do to increase traction, but reducing wind resistance is another matter. We recently went to the Walter Beach Memorial Wind Tunnel at Wichita State University. We were looking for ways to reduce drag so we can get more speed from the horsepower that we already have. We took two s and bikes that had both gone over 200 miles per hour at Bonneville. We took Tramp 3 and my Bonneville Buell. We also took a turbocharged Kawasaki ZX-14 owned by Gene Delask, one of our guys in product development. Gene has made a number of runs over 215 miles per hour on the paved mile land speed tracks. s and doesn't make anything for that bike, but we wanted to have another data point for comparison. The first bike we put in a wind tunnel was Tramp 3. To save time, I volunteered to be the crash test dummy on the bike. Why do we need a rider? Well, as far as the wind is concerned, the rider is part of the shape of the motorcycle. Alright, here we go. So that's where your drag comes from, by the way. That separation right there. Yep. As you can see, we'll do a free stream right over it. That's actually, from what we see, that is really good. That's a really good shot right there. Wow, is that good? Look at that vortex. Look at the vortex coming right there off his helmet. What we found out with Tramp 3 was that the shape was really pretty good. Air flowed around it really well, so it didn't create a lot of turbulence and drag. Next, we put the Buell in the wind tunnel. And before we even got the smoke stream going, we discovered this problem. It was obvious that changes needed to be made to reduce the side-to-side -side buffeting and to make the bike more stable. When we did use the smoke stream, we also discovered that the shape of the fairing and rider created a lot of separation of the stream. That indicates turbulence and drag. 
That's slowing me down. A fairly involved way, doesn't it? Yeah. The sides are like, that seems almost acceptable. Finally, we put the ZX-14 in the tunnel, and we were sort of surprised again. There was a lot of turbulence behind the rider, which is going to create a lot of drag. But the airflow around the sides was really pretty good. This trip to the wind tunnel was a real eye-opener for us. We found out that Tramp 3, which was built in the late 1980s, is really a great design. Of the three bikes we tested, it was by far the most aerodynamic. The real difference here is that Tramp was built to fit within a slippery fairing, while the fairing on the Buell was built around an existing motorcycle. The ZX-14 is a street bike with a stock fairing and not a purpose-built Bonneville race bike. Taking what we've learned, we're given Jeff's fairing a major makeover in the hopes of gaining more stability at high speeds and reducing the drag enough to take him over 215 miles an hour for a new speed record and to qualify him for the 200 mile an hour club. Of course, being engine guys, we're going to find some more horsepower just for insurance. Yeah, I'm going to look pretty good in that red hat too. <laughs> <laughs>